What is a robot? The word brings to mind famous robots from TV and movies. R2-D2 and C-3PO from Star Wars, Rosie from The Jetsons, or Hal from 2001, A Space Odyssey. In pop culture, robots are artificially intelligent personal assistants, which talk and interact like people do. But the word robot also describes Roomba vacuum cleaners, machines used on assembly lines in manufacturing, military drones, and toys like Ibo the robotic dog. Some robots are designed to do a specific task, like pick a box out of a warehouse, and others must be designed to navigate in the real world and interact with people, both of which require the robot to be dynamic and responsive to uncertainty. From these examples, we see that a robot could take many forms. No one definition seems to cover all of the things we call robots. In fact, it's very difficult to define what exactly makes something a robot. Even academics who think and write about robots have different ways of tackling this difficulty. At the Tech Policy Lab, we reviewed hundreds of academic papers and books about robots across disciplines in order to understand different ways that scholars approach this problem. We found that it was very common to pass over the problem of defining robots and instead to trace the word back to its roots. In 1927, a Czech playwright named Karl Kapek used the word in his play, R-U-R, Rossum's Universal Robots. Robot is derived from a Czech word, robota, which means drudgery, slave labor, or hard work. In the play, the robots are designed as humanoid servants who go on to overthrow their creators. The idea of robot as slave may get at something useful. Robots are designed to help people to do dirty or dangerous tasks that humans can't usually do themselves. Many robots are designed for extreme environments like space or deep ocean exploration. They also perform unpleasant, repetitive tasks that a human would rather not. But the etymology of the word robot only gets us so far. Robots are not just machines that labor for humans. There are too many technologies that would fit this definition that don't count as robots, like washing machines and tractors. As a definition, this one doesn't capture any of the qualities that make robots unique. In our research, we found three broad approaches that scholars use to define robots. None of these approaches offers a definition that works for all of the ways we already use the word, but they're a start. The first way that scholars define robots is that they are artificial humans. Scholars who explore robots from this perspective think that robots have historically been a way that inventors, philosophers, and authors explore what it means to be human. We found that this approach was most often used by scholars in literature, cinema studies, and history. By defining robots as artificial humans, some historians consider robots to be part of a continuum with their early counterparts called automatons. Automatons are mechanical contraptions that were built to imitate the movements of humans and animals as far back as ancient Greece. Of course, the concept of artificial humans also encompasses the Gollum, Frankenstein, and other concepts we don't think of as robots. A second approach involves defining robots as programmable machines. This conceptualization is largely found in industrial engineering and reflects a focus on surgical robots, warehouse parcel picking robots, or manufacturing robots on an assembly line. Programmable machines is also the way that judges tend to conceptualize robots in court decisions, as our analysis of over a half century of cases involving robots reveals. Defining robots as programmable machines is, like artificial humans, over-inclusive. It applies to dishwashers, programmable coffee machines, and even graphing calculators. A third view defines robots as machines that can sense, think, and act. By sense, they mean that robots have sensors that can touch or see, that can take in information in a dynamic environment. By think, it is meant that any robot must be able to process information it senses. For example, to figure out how far away an object is or how tightly to grasp it. Then, a robot must be able to act on that information with effectors. Robot arms, legs, hands, or other ways of affecting the world around it. This way of defining robots was very common in roboticists from computer science and has the advantage of distinguishing robots from previous or constituent technologies like the computer. The sense-think-act definition seems to work for many purposes. For example, the robot vacuum cleaner, Roomba, moves around a room using infrared sensors. It also has sensors for detecting when it bumps into something. When it does hit a wall, it acts accordingly, avoiding the wall as it proceeds. Thinking of robots as machines that can sense, think, and act isn't without any definitional troubles. Here's a small toy. 
when you wind it up, it starts moving. When it senses the edge of the table, it stops and heads in a different direction. In a way, this mechanical toy senses, thinks, and acts. But would you call this a robot? Most scholars who promote the sense, think, act paradigm define robots as embodied, physical things that move around and interact in the real world. As software becomes more sophisticated at processing, interpreting, and acting in unpredictable online environments, how important will embodiment continue to be for defining a robot? How we define robots matters to writing good policy, or not so good. The state of Nevada had to rewrite a 2011 law because the definition they used for autonomous cars was accidentally far too broad. It included cars with anti-lock brakes and many other common features within their definition of autonomous cars. While we don't have a universal definition for robot, we hope to have offered a practical way to examine definitions you encounter and to think about how definitions for emerging technologies play out in a policy setting.